Good morning, anyway. Uh, my name is Gurmeet Singh. And of course, I want to talk to you on a subject which is very important, but is very boring. But I was just looking at the water that was supplied and as I was asked to drink and was looking at the bottom. The water is manufactured by the Cebu Water Board. And we are drinking it here in Selangor. So it's how commercialized things have become. How much problems we seem to have water that we have to drink water from bottle of water. And they said, it's pipe water that has been treated. Why can't we drink pipe water? Now, I want to talk about sustainability of water because to me, water is going to be the next global issue after climate change. Uh, therefore, I think my organization and I have been especially concerned about water and we want to examine why Malaysia's water is not being sustainably managed. Now, the questions are why? Why do we want to look at sustainability of water? Mainly because we have to look at the complexities of the water chain which have ultimately reflected in the fact that you cannot trust the quality of water that you are getting from your tap. What has happened? This is because there are so many complexities in Malaysia, not only physical complexities, that the water starts from the mountains, gets polluted as it comes in the rivers, then people abstract it from the river, polluted water, treat it, put chemicals to remove pollutants, it comes to your tap, and in the process, it gets corrosion from the pipes, as well as silt that is included in the thing. So, at the end of it, most people now have to buy water filters. Not only water filters, they have to boil the water before they can drink or buy all this bottled water, which was never the case when I was growing up. Right? So, it shows this is also partly the problem because we have, in the water situation, a real problem of management. We have the federal government, which has overall jurisdiction over natural resources, but water is one of the main issues that is under the sole purview of state government. So the state governments are extremely jealous, especially they look at water as a revenue resource. But most of them cannot on their own manage the water properly itself. They have to get loans from the federal government. And then on top of it, we have the position of a lot of people not really even appreciating the importance of water. Yet they don't realize that almost 70% of our body is made out of water. And if you don't have the water, your body doesn't exist. Uh, you try to dehydrate yourself. So, the question, I've chosen not to use slides, partly because I've sort of got, got bored by preparing slides. And I find that the flexibility of slides is not there. You tend to focus on the slides, not on the speaker. So I'm the only visual. You don't have slides, right? Uh, the question I want to ask is, where is the money? The problem is, most people don't want to pay the real cost of water. That's why you find many people asking, water should be free. But you know, when life, in life, anything that's free is never really value. You give somebody, invite somebody to a conference and say, oh, it's free of charge. The chances are the person may not turn up. You have prepared the food and everything. It goes to waste. So similarly, water is, when it's not costed, it's not appreciated. And there is a tendency to waste. Then we also have a problem of how do you, who will then pay for the cost of treating the water to supply you? Or for the matter, even to supply water for the irrigation of the thing. A lot of people don't know that the bulk of our surface rainwater actually goes for irrigation, not for your drinking. So if we can reduce the amount of water that goes for irrigation, we would have more water available for drinking. Then we don't need to build more dams. But that's the other issue at all. Now, then the question people ask, many people argue, and I agree with them, water is a basic right. But does it mean if it's a basic right, it should be free? Then it goes back to the question, who is going to pay for the cost of treating the water to supply to you? So many of us who believe that the real poor should perhaps be provide either subsidized water or relatively free water, but we have to make sure they don't waste. Because the problem with free thing is you tend to waste. Even now, if you look at the pricing of water in Penang, for example, which is the cheapest rate, and you look at the per capita consumption of water in Penang, it is much higher than that of Slango, because it's relatively cheap. So, waste. 
And then the question arises is, how do we ensure that relatively affordable water is conserved? Now, but if you examine the overall picture, you ask yourself the next question, what are the dis disruptive forces in water? To me, of course, one of the common ones, which many people don't want to talk about, but they're talking about now, is corruption. Corruption all along the chain, from the way the dams are built, contracts are given, all the way, corruption. Corruption causes a lot of problems. Then there are inefficiencies. All of you know, even in the private sector, there are inefficiencies. There is hardly any organization in this country that has 100% efficiency all along. Government is even worse. You find, you send a letter, for example, I sent a letter to the Minister of Water. He couldn't reply for more than one week to say he couldn't come for a function. No. That's the sort of inefficiencies that creep all along. And one of the biggest weaknesses I've noticed in Malaysia is lack of implementation of regulations. That is also another disruptive thing. So, in fact, we have a lot of regulations in water, just as we have a lot of regulation in the environment. But the question is, why are they not being implemented fairly and uniformly? Now, who cares? This is my other bug. I've, in fact, done a presentation where I talked about who cares about water. To me, nobody really cares about water until there's a breakdown, until you don't get water. And then everybody gets concerned. Otherwise, you take water for granted. So the caring is important and the investment is important. You don't wait for a drought. You don't wait for the pipe water to be cut. You make sure you conserve water so that it is available for the long time. Now, do we only want water for humans? That's the other problem. Most people don't realize that water is important for all ecological, all living things. So when people do studies like our group, when we did this study last year, we too made the mistake of looking at water only from the human perspective. What about water for the ecosystems? What about water for the living things, the trees and the plants? We only talk about water for crops that need. What about the trees? They need water. What about the insects? But we never really factor when we plan there is enough water available for the ecosystem. And do how vulnerable is water to climate change? To me, very, very vulnerable because one of the first indications of climate change is what they call increase in ex, ex, uh, extreme weather conditions. And what are extreme weather conditions? Floods and droughts. And these are increasing in intensity. And this is definitely the case, and it will worsen. On top of it, you find that a lot of people don't realize that climate change also affects water that you feed for the dams. Remember there was a case a couple of years ago, when almost half the electricity of Vietnam was gone because there was not enough water in the dams. They were relying on the hydroelectric dams. So water is crucial and climate change worsens the availability of water. Now, the next question I would like to ask, what should it be done and by whom? To me, this report that we have just produced comes out with a list of recommendations, about more than 20 recommendations, which we think a whole range of actors in Malaysia, ranging from the federal government to the local authority, to ordinary consumers, to the private sector, need to act on if we want to ensure sustainability is mentioned. But the problem is, as I said, we always tend to push the responsibility to somebody else. Who is responsible for keeping the rivers clean? Oh, government, everything government. But what about you when you throw your rubbish? into the river itself, or when you pee in the river itself, you know? All these people who go to the uh, resorts, you know, waterfalls, how many children are peeing in the waterfalls? And what happens to the water? You're polluting the water. So almost everybody is responsible for polluting water in this country. Now, my question then follows is, why do we pollute? To me, for selfishness, we don't want to take the trouble to throw the plastic bag in the proper dump. We throw it into the Long Kang. Long Kang gets carried into the river. Water gets polluted. That's only just one example. You go to hawker stalls. Many hawker stalls are located very often near rivers. And what do the hawkers do? Everything gets poured into the drain or the Long Kang itself. So we don't want to take the trouble to treat it in a proper place. And I think the other problem we have is uh, 
people have this mentality, you know, especially I think the original people in this country, the indigenous people in the Malays, when the population was small, water was a moving thing. It was convenient, Longkang, we should carry the rubbish away. Population was small, the amount, the rate of water flow was high. So it didn't really get polluted. But as the population increased, you can't keep on treating it as a long Kang. And what are our ecological responsibilities? This is the question. Many of us don't really care to find out what is our ecological footprint. There are many measures available. For example, what is our water footprint? Water footprint is not only measured in terms of the water you use every day, but how much water goes into producing the food that you eat, even the coffee that you drink. Somebody actually did a study and it showed that coffee, to produce a cup of coffee, requires more water than to produce a cup of tea. So he, as a point, said, I will not drink coffee anymore. I will only drink tea. But how many of us really bother to find out what is the water footprint of our daily life? Just as I have been talking for a long time about energy, I've been telling people, hey, you talk about climate change, then you find out how much energy you're using. Very simple. Go and measure your electricity bill every month. That will give you how much electricity you're using. Look at your petrol that you're using. Now, and you remember, in Peninsula Malaysia, every unit of electricity is equivalent to emitting one kg of CO2. So you will know from your electricity bill how much CO2 you are emitting. Then if you, your petrol is 2.4 kg of CO2. So every liter of petrol that you use is 2.4 kg of CO2. So you can easily calculate what your Climate footprint is at least from those two sectors. And if you want to make a change, and this is why many people say, I can't make a change, you cut down. Cut down on your electricity cut consumption, cut down on your petrol consumption. Then you can contribute something. But very often, we don't want to do things. We point fingers at other Ah, let the big fellas do. In the past, at the national level, we used to point at China, India, and US as the big emitters of climate change, all they have to do, but every one of us is actually contributing. And in fact, if you look at the per capita energy, uh, greenhouse gas emissions of Malaysia, we are very high. We are almost at 11 tons per capita, which is almost higher than many of the European Union countries. Similarly for water, but things have not been done for water that systematically. What are the suggestions for improving and ensuring sustainability? We should say, we should start we should start conserving water itself. We should look at this report, which I, for which I brought a few copies for sale, those of you who are interested, and see the recommendation that we made for ensuring sustainability of water. We call this report Towards Water Sustainability. And we just finished completed it in November. We have sent it to all the relevant government agencies, and we have appointed people who will monitor the implementation of these recommendations. They, were, they are going to pester all the relevant people and have you decided which recommendation you're going to implement? And we are going to do this over a five year period. We also need to, most importantly of all, if we want to sustainably manage resources, we need to preserve the sources of water. What are the sources of water? The forests, we have to protect water catchments. But many water catchments in Malaysia are not even gazetted. And we have wonderful people who go and develop water catchments, build factories there, clear the land, put palm oil plantation there. People forget that once you clear a water catchment area, your rate of recharge of water in the stream gets reduced. Because whenever it rains, the rain rushes off straight away from the river, you get floods downstream, but after that, very little flows into the charge the river. So the rest of the time, the river shrinks in quantity. Then we allow rivers to be polluted. Why do we allow rivers to be polluted? You look at the Department of the Environment report. I used to sit on the Environmental Quality Council for a long time, almost 20 years. And I found that even up to today, taking example of the Klang River, the Klang River has been polluted since 1975. We have been crying out loud. We did measurements in 1975 to show the Klang River was polluted. But 
hasn't happened. Now they have the River of Life project. What does he do? Only a small stretch of river between in KL at the confluence where they pump the dirty water, river water up, treat it and discharge. That portion only looks clean. But the river upstream of that and downstream is as polluted as it was in 75, if not worse. And then one of the other things that we can do is why don't we, instead of allowing water for treatment plants to be caught in a dam, discharge into the river to be polluted and abstracted downstream, why don't we lay pipes directly from the dam to the treatment plants so that no pollutants enter the water? Costly, but you offset the recurring cost of pollution. And then the other issue that we have raised and which should be implemented is why do we supply treated water to industries who don't need that quality of drinking water quality for the cooling water? Why don't we just abstract raw water, pipe it directly to the factory areas, let them treat, and the other raw water goes to final distribution reservoirs in residential areas where you treat that. So that even if there's a bus pipe along the way, you don't lose treated water. You lose raw water, that's all, right? So these are some of the things and some of the suggestions here. You can come up with many ideas, but the important point I want to give the message is let us not ignore water. Do not take water for granted and do not assume that water in this country is sustainably managed. Thank you.